spirit of yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Reading from Hebrews, the 12th chapter. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Ever since this parable was first told, teachers, preachers alike, have all focused upon the younger son. Isn't that the one that kind of jumps out at us? Even a liturgy that was prepared for us tonight pretty much talks about the younger son. And yet, this parable is really about two sons. Jesus says right at the start, there was a man who had two sons, and yet we sometimes just kind of dismiss the other son who comes in much later in this parable. It's a rather lengthy parable in which Jesus tells in basically two parts. First telling the story of what I would call the runaway, the younger son, and then telling us a little bit later about the older son, his refusal to celebrate his brother's homecoming. So tonight as we take our walk with Jesus of Nazareth, I would encourage you to challenge yourself to see us as maybe both sons in this parable. One prodigal and the other proud and perfect. Which is the easier one to be? You know, okay, I can be the prodigal, but I'm certainly not that one who is proud, right? The one who is perfect. Rembrandt paints a well-known Return of the Prodigal painting. Many believe he had painted that about himself, that he was the prodigal home again, and gently embraced by his father. And yet Shakespeare takes a little bit different idea on it. He found inspiration in both sons, actually, in the parable, as we watch the two sons of the king in Henry IV, Prince Hal and Prince John. So now, the stage is set for this evening, and now it is our turn. If ever you have felt, or maybe even carried yourself some distance from the Lord, remove yourself so far from the Father's provision and love, you're the prodigal. If you have ever hit rock bottom, tried everything you can to pull yourself up out of it, but to no avail, you are the prodigal. If you know what it means to all of a sudden come to your senses and long for what you once had, if you are someone who really knows deep down in your heart and believes that there still is mercy in God's heart, you still are the prodigal. To all you prodigals like me, all you mercy beggars, Jesus Christ wants you to know one thing through this parable. He wants you to know that God is always willing to take you back. God will always embrace you, dirty, shoeless as the picture in which Rembrandt, Rembrandt paints. He takes you back just as you are, without one plea. You see, there is nothing you or I can do that is so evil that God won't forgive you. God is always waiting for you. He suffered for you, selfless and sacrificial love. You can always go home to him again. Because when you go home, he has a celebration plan for you that reaches all the way to heaven. You were dead, and yet now you are alive. So the riches of God can be yours all over again. After this rebellion that you may be currently in, and even after the next one, this time, come home to stay. You and I are also the older son, the shorter part of the parable. You see, we sometimes forget that Jesus told this parable to the good and pious religious leaders of his day. Luke actually introduces 
these parables in the chapter with these words. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. This parable is also for you and for me. You and me who are regular worshipers, here on Sundays, here on Wednesdays, the faithful, those of us who have stayed close to God the Father, those of us who have worked hard in his church, staying home even when tempted to maybe take off and do something different. Even if feeling that you and I have a close relationship with Jesus of Nazareth out of a I'll call it almost a feeling of obligation. Maybe it's something, it was the way you were brought up, it's something like, this is something I got to do, which is a good thing also. But rather than taking that as being grateful love for being able to be in the house of God with other Christians, you and I are the older son. Even if a dutiful member of the church family for so long that you've forgotten maybe the sheer wonder of God's forgiveness, you are the older son. And if all the hard work you've done in this church and all the subsequent hard work you've done for the kingdom of God has left you proud in your faith, maybe, or resentful, maybe, of others, unable to celebrate with the angels when a, a sinner repents, then you and I are the older son. Within us, the older son is that scribe that Pharisee who looks down on others and just wonders why Jesus would even maybe waste his time on those people. Telling ourselves that we won God's favor by our consistent goodness. We keep the Ten Commandments with just a few minor infractions and those that we break or those we maybe bend a little bit, we can make up for being a little extra good, a little extra nice, a little extra hard working. And frankly, sometimes doesn't it just grate us to see some gross sinner? Maybe it's a politician. I always pick on politicians, I know, but they're the ones that are in the media. They're the ones whose faces you see. They're the ones that somehow lie and the lie comes back and it just doesn't seem to ever impact them. But that doesn't mean they're not Christians. That doesn't mean they don't worship God and, and believe. But when we see those kind of people getting God's good favor, aren't we aggravated a little bit? Or don't we just kind of question and wonder? Maybe we even question if they are sincere. Raise our eyebrows maybe when someone's sin is made public. We may even say something like, and I thought they were a Christian. As if we were never saints and sinners ourselves. Jesus makes sure we're perfectly clear how hard the father works to get his firstborn into the party. How he takes that son's bitterness, insults, even anger. Patiently, he however waits for this son too. He waits for the self-righteous to eat with the sinners and to be counted as one of them. Jesus abruptly ends this parable. No explanation. He doesn't come back later as he does with his disciples. He may have told his disciples, but he doesn't tell us, at least it's not recorded in Scripture, what does this parable actually mean. So it leaves us to kind of imagine things, in particular, the older son. What happens? We know what happened to the younger son, right? He's received back by God, but we hear nothing about the older son. So maybe we can just project, which is what I kind of did in my own mind, because this is what I heard someone say once. The story ends, they said, with the older brother going into the party, and once inside, he kills his father. I'm like, well, that sounds crazy. But is it really? 
That is actually what happened in the history of the world. The father in this story, let's say, is Jesus Christ. And he is killed for the sins of all the sons and all the daughters of the world. He's killed for all the prodigals, all the older, all the younger. And Jesus Christ becomes the son once dead but is now alive. From Isaiah 42. Here's my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or cry out or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes justice on earth. In his law, the islands will put their hope. It is all about Jesus Christ. Amen.